Hello, and welcome to the video series, Mastering the INCOSI System Engineering Handbook, in preparation for the INCOSI System Engineering Professional Exam. This is video number 18, and it covers the uh, chapter 5.3 in the System Engineering Handbook, known as the Decision Management Process. My name is Lance Sherry, and I will be the guide for this chapter. So we do system engineering because we have complex systems that are developed in complex life cycles. And to help us uh, manage that process uh, as effectively as possible, the INCOSI System Engineering Handbook has kindly identified all of the processes and activities uh, to achieve that goal. Um, the INCOSI System Engineering Handbook has identified 59 system engineering life cycle processes and activities. And those 59 processes and activities are organized into seven groups. The topic of this video is uh, the chapter five, the group known as the technical management processes. And very specifically, we're going to talk about the decision management process. Um, system engineering uh, projects, system engineering, the idea of creating and upgrading and retrofitting systems, is managed by execution of projects. So that's the uh, scope or the way that we think about the, all of the activities that have to be done to uh, create and upgrade and retrofit and operate a project. The technical management process uh, processes are the eight uh, processes you can see on the right-hand side that are all associated with uh, developing the plans uh, and then executing the plans and then managing and controlling to the plans. And as we've pointed out previously, there's a very close relationship between project management and system engineering. Uh, the two activities have to work very closely together in order to, uh, to have good results. The topic of this video is the decision management process. And, um, very much like the systems analysis process that was in the technical processes in section four of the book, the decision management process is a way of doing the analysis related to all things that are conducted in the technical management process. So the decision management process is used in project planning and project assessment and risk management and so on. So it's kind of an overarching set of techniques uh, that are used to make good decisions in project management. The learning objectives for this video are to discuss the purpose of the decision management process, then the outputs, inputs, and process activities of the decision management process, um, look at the kinds of decisions that can occur throughout the project life cycle, some examples, and then to discuss the types of, of uh, decision making that are discussed in the handbook, uh, namely decision trees and multi-objective decision analysis. So decision trees and multi-objective decision analysis are two kinds of decision making processes that are discussed in the handbook. So let's jump into the definition of the system management process. As described in the handbook, the decision management process is to select the most beneficial course of action at various points in the life cycle by evaluating a set of alternatives using an objective framework. So we're uh, executing our project and we come across a situation that requires us to make a decision uh, that can occur anywhere in the life cycle. Uh, we want to make the decision to have the most benefit. We want to take the actions that result in the most benefit. And uh, to do that, we have to evaluate alternatives. And of course, we want to do this in an objective way that's repeatable and that uh, uses data and uh, that we can explain to others. So in plain language, on the bottom of the chart, uh, this manage decision management process is uh, making difficult decisions in a transparent, uh, repeatable way in the best interests of all of the stakeholders and very importantly, to keep the project moving so that we don't end up stuck uh, waiting for a decision. 
So the, uh, the handbook discusses or provides some examples of the kinds of decisions that are made in different phases of the life cycle. Um, in the concept phase, you're trying to decide if there is a market and what, what product to build. So all of those things are associated with an assessing the business case and uh, coming up with the initial capability definition, uh, trading of uh, stakeholder requirements. So which, you know, which requirements should be built and why, and how does that impact the, uh, uh, the uh, success of, this, of the product in the marketplace. So all of those decisions have to be made in the concept phase. In the development phase, we're now building the system, and so a very common decision is the selection of the architecture, um, deciding what technologies to use as alternatives, and selecting test and evaluation methods. So once you get into production, then there's a common decision is make or buy, whether you're going to make something yourself or you're going to purchase it off the shelf from a third party. Uh, you have to select production processes, and in some cases, uh, you select you know, a location, a geographic location in which to uh, build the system. Uh, utilization support phase, uh, as we discussed in the technical the processes section, there are several different approaches to maintenance, and you may, you will have to pick one of those. And the same thing for retirement phase, there are alternative ways of disposing the system, and it's necessary to pick the best one uh, for disposal. So this is a summary, not a complete list, but the kinds of things in which the decision management process is used. Um, so in terms of a uh, input-output uh, chart, uh, we've got the decision that must be made coming in as an input. Uh, we want to analyze the decision uh, information and then make a good decision. And then the output is the result of the decision. And of course, very important to, uh, along with the decision, is to establish the assumptions and the data that was used uh, for the decision. The uh, handbook describes a 10-step process for decision management. And um, I, I kind of like to break it up into three phases. So the first phrase, step one through five, is a, uh, a first pass at the decision. And it's typically done using a deterministic uh, process. So we're not taking into account uh, uncertainty uh, uh, probabilities. So step number one is to frame the decision establish the objectives and measures, and then establish the alternatives. So steps one, two, and three, we just set things up so that we understand what the decision is that we're trying to make and how we're going to measure it. Um, so that takes us uh, one, two, three, is to kind of frame and set up the decision. Once we get to four, then we're going to do an analysis of the benefits and drawbacks of the alternatives. And typically, you want to do that in a deterministic way um, to kind of lay the groundwork. Uh, you, uh, step five, you synthesize the results, uh, understand the results, and be able to communicate them. And then step six, uh, seven, and eight, well, now we're going to evaluate the uh, initial results a little bit more carefully, and particularly with regard to uncertainty. We want to understand uh, how much information we have and how certain we are of that, inf that information. Um, you know, perhaps about what the future is going to look like, and perhaps what the yield will be in a production process. Uh, so we want to incorporate the degree of uncertainty into our process, and we call that stochastic analysis to differentiate that from deterministic analysis. A big part of that uh, analysis, is too, is to look at uh, the risk and sensitivity. So if you adjust uh, um, the uncertainty of one parameter, how does that affect the decision? Um, so sensitivity analysis is very, very important to understand um, how brittle the decision is or how robust the decision is, and more importantly, how each of the input factors can change the decision. So related to the sensitivity analysis is this idea of improving alternatives. With the sensitivity analysis, we can evaluate what would happen if we were to improve um, one of the alternatives just a little bit. We may want to invest in some research in that. We may want to invest in more time in exploring the market of other uh, providers, uh, vendors for uh, a component. 
And so that is the opportunity to evaluate which alternatives are close to each other and see if there's any benefits of one over the other. And then lastly, we're going to communicate the trade-offs uh, and then present the results and implementation. So kind of the, the uh, quick review of the phases, we're going to uh, frame the decision, establish the objectives and measures, establish the alternatives, and then we're going to do uh, a alternative analysis using deterministic, uh, kind of a simple first pass. Uh, once we understand those results, then we're going to go a little bit more complicated and take into account uncertainty. Uh, yielding both a risk and sensitivity analysis, um, and then uh, kind of tie things up with communicating, presenting the results, and the implementation plan. Um, so the um, this process, uh, um, you know, distinguishes between two kinds of uh, decision making. One is the deterministic analysis. And then second is an analysis that takes into account probability and uncertainty, and we would generally call that a stochastic uh, an analysis. The handbook describes uh, two types of decisions, and um, I've kind of added a third class of decision making um, to this discussion. This is a fascinating topic. and. Um, Unfortunately, you know, we can't do justice to it in this uh, short video. But let's go through the three kinds of decisions, uh, decision methods that the handbook uh, discusses. The handbook starts off with the decision tree, and that's kind of a simple uh, process where you identify the decisions that have to be made, uh, the role of chance associated with those decisions, and, uh, and then the, the outcomes. So these decision trees are very good when you have a, a single objective and the decision outcome can be measured all in the same units. So a typical way of measuring uh, the decision is in terms of dollars, in terms of cost. And um, these de this decision tree approach is very useful uh, when your decision is entirely all, uh, all apples or all, all cost and there's a single objective. So many times in life uh, we have situations where there are complete competing objectives and that's where we get to uh, number two, the multi-objective decision analysis, the MODA methods. So this is a case where we have multiple conflicting decision outcomes. An example of that is the ill at ease, um, where we want to trade off uh, you know, various uh, performance characteristics of the system we can't get them all to be maximum. Um, we have to make some trade-offs. Um, again, the, the motor analysis is limited to decision outcomes in a single unit, such as cost. And uh, typically associated with these motors is an objective function that uh, you then run an optimization algorithm on with constraints and uh, find the, the, the optimum uh, point in the, in the trade space. Um, so many times as system engineers, you'll be faced with a situation where the decision outcome is not in a single unit like cost. And so the third category is the multi-attribute utility analysis. And that's a situation where you have to kind of compare apples and oranges. So the decision outcomes are in different units. Again, this is multiple conflicting decision outcomes such as illities. And the kind of recommended way to do that is to use a utility function. Uh, where the utility function is a, uh, a weighted sum of values for each one of the attributes of your decision. So typically you calculate the utility for the alternatives and then plot it on a utility versus life cycle cost chart. And this way here um, you can see the uh, value of utility versus the costs uh, for each of the design alternatives. So fascinating topic, and obviously not enough time to do this uh, topic justice in this video. So we're at the end of the video, and here's an opportunity to uh, see how much you know. Um, so you can uh, pause the video at this point, get a piece of paper, and uh, see if you can answer these questions. And then when you're done, you can go to the, to the next slide. So here we are at the next slide with uh, the answers to the questions. I hope you did well. 
And finally, uh, we are at the last page. Uh, so this is the decision management process, and the next video is risk management process. So we'd be grateful if you could give us a thumbs up. Thank you.